These are the oldest stories online at oldeststories.net. We are in the midst of a cultural golden age in our story. While there would be occasional disruptions, Hammurabi would be followed by five reasonably competent kings who would each reign for decades, from 21 years to 47 years, averaging 33 per reign. Stability and order will breed prosperity, and that will feed a new wave of scribes who are copying older literary works and producing new ones at a quick pace. One of these new works is a tale of myth, originating from the town of Dunu, or sometimes Dunham. The work itself is sometimes called the Theogony of Dunu, or sometimes the Dynasty of Dunu, or occasionally the Harab myth. Dunu itself means something like fortress, and was the name of a handful of minor towns in ancient Mesopotamia around this time. We don't know to which Dunu this text is referring, and even if we did, we don't actually know the locations of any of the Dunus mentioned in ancient records. All this should give you a taste of the uncertainty that surrounds this document. However, Though quite a lot is unclear, and the latter half of the text itself is partially garbled, there is quite a lot of interesting things that can be gleaned from this one relatively short text. And so before going any further, I'm going to read you the entire intact portion, and then summarize our best understanding of the badly damaged second half. In the beginning, Plow married Earth, and they decided to establish a family and a dominion. We shall break up the virgin soil of the land into clods, they announced, and in the furrows of their virgin soil they created the sea. These furrows then, of their own accord, begot the cattle god Amakandu. Together they built the city of Dunu as their eternal refuge. Plow made unrestricted dominion for himself in Dunu, and then the earth raised her face to the cattle god, her son, and said to him, Let me love you. So the cattle god married Earth, his mother, and killed Plow, his father, preceding the story of Oedipus by a thousand years. They laid Plow to rest in Dunu, the city which he loved, and the cattle god took over his father's dominion. The cattle god married his older sister, the sea, and the two gave birth to the god of flocks, or domesticated cattle, named either Lahar or Gaim. The god of flocks came up and murdered his father, the cattle god, and in Dunu laid him to rest in the tomb of his father. Flocks then married the sea, his mother, and in response slew earth, her mother. And on the sixteenth day of the month of Kislimu, flocks became the ruler of the universe. Phlox and C came to have four children. One is a son whose name is unreadable, and another was the daughter Ida, the river goddess. This son then married his sister Rivers, and the couple murdered their father and mother, burying them in the city of Dunu. On the first day of the month of Tebet, he assumed kingship. But another son of Phlox was the herdsman god. With the extremely restricted dating pool, he married the only other woman in the world, the goddess of pastures and poplar trees. Together, herdsmen and pasture made the fields of the earth abundant and filled the pens with sheep to feed all the creatures of the world and provide the needed things for sacrificing to the gods. He murdered his unnamed brother and his sister the rivers, avenging a patricide with a fratricide, burying his siblings in Dunu, and on a certain day of the month Shabbat, he took for himself the crown. Herdsmen and pastors would have children in turn, Haharnam and Belitseri, who may be a version of Gestion Anna. No sooner would these two children get married than they would murder their parents, sticking them in the increasingly full tomb in Dunu, and on the sixteenth day of the month Adar, Haharnam would be crowned king of the gods. Haharnam and Belitseri would have two children, Hayashem and an unnamed daughter. These two children would marry, but in a hitherto unprecedented development, Hayashem would not be murdering his father. Instead, he calls out to the guards of the city of Dunham and orders them to arrest his father and imprison him alive. Hayashem would then take the throne. And it's here, right as our story really gets interesting, 
that the tablet shatters into fragments, though more than half the story has already been finished. From the very hazy reconstructions, it seems that subsequent generations grow increasingly more civilized, and before too long, the far more familiar gods of Mesopotamia emerge. Enlil, traditionally accounted as the king of gods, emerges and gives birth to two sons, Ninurta and Nuska, both of whom come to share power in the universe peaceably. And this appears to be the situation in the heavens as the priests of the city of Danu recognized it. But what are we to make of this peculiar myth? Stylistically, it's been described as quite blunt, lacking many of the flourishes common in other myths, and paring the story down to its essentials. This may have been because the tablet was less meant as a book to be read aloud verbatim, and more of a memory aid for the priest reciting the legend, who would be expected to include details from his own knowledge of the gods and the story. Or it may have been that the people of Dunham, a relatively rural town, lacked the sophistication to appreciate a more elaborate story and needed things kept simple. The meaning of the myth is debated among scholars. Some have proposed that the different gods represent aspects of the natural cycle of the year, connecting the months given to the natures of the gods, though it isn't clear that the surviving parts of the story really do line up with any relevant agricultural practices. It's also proposed that the gradual shift from shocking barbarism to relative peace is meant to match the shift from barbarism to civilization among the agricultural community of Dunham, thus implicitly telling the people listening that they should be better than the old practices. The first murderers are the wild cattle, and as they shift first to domestication, then shepherding, the gods grow less outrageously incestuous, and with the development of the city, they stop murdering their parents altogether. And at the end we see the agricultural god Ninurta behaving peacefully with his brother and father. Of course, there's also the possibility that it was simply meant as objective empirical truth, much the way modern biblical literalists take the book of Genesis, or the way everyone else treats modern history textbooks. Perhaps this is where the city of Dunham came from, whether the people liked it or not. Whatever the case, we can see from this account that it has very little to do with the creation myth popular in Babylon, the Enuma Elish, nor with the multiple other Sumerian accounts of the early universe covered in previous episodes. What we label as Mesopotamian religion was a whole patchwork of local communities with local traditions, and the fact that gods were accepted in many places speaks to the accepting syncretism of ancient polytheism, but it doesn't make it all the same faith at all points in time and all places. What's more, we may not even be focusing on the most well-known or popular versions of ancient myths, since some scholars trace the influence of this fairly obscure theogony into Phoenician, Hittite, and even Greek cosmogonies. Almost certainly, there were far more stories written than have survived to today, and I'm forever mourning on this show the loss of so much good material. But if the old Babylonian Empire was such a golden age for cultural activity, then this would be a good time to take a look at the people actually doing all this scribing. They were, with few exceptions, men, and never made up more than 1 or 2% of the population at a very maximum. But they were, in many ways, the glue which held Mesopotamia together, both economically and culturally. Theoretically, a scribe could come from any background, and some sons of craftsmen who may have been of fairly modest means managed to make it into the school, though in practice it was wealthier families who had both the resources to support an idle son through years of schooling and pay the possibly quite high school fees. But the one thing every literate man in Babylon had in common, indeed every literate man in the previous Akkadian and Sumerian eras as well, was the Eduba. Literally meaning house of clay tablets, this was the formalized school system for all cuneiform cultures, and appears to have changed shockingly little from its inception shortly after the invention of writing around 3000 BCE through the end of the old Babylonian period. 
Edubas have been excavated throughout the Mesopotamian world, and they're all remarkably similar in structure. A few benches and tables that could likely have held 10 to 15 students, though that number is highly uncertain and may have varied from place to place. At the back or middle of the room would have been a large bucket for placing used clay tablets in after they were filled up, to be cleaned and remade for the next day's exercises. Despite this recycling, thousands of school exercises have been recovered that allow us to sketch an outline of the education system and curriculum. A young boy, and it was always boys, the number of literate women was vanishingly small, began school at around the age of five to seven and continued until young adulthood, possibly around 15 years old, plus or minus a few years. It isn't clear if he attended school every month of the year or just most months, but when class was in session, he attended 24 days each month, with three days being free days and three days being set aside for religious festival attendance. Class began at sunrise and continued until either late afternoon or sunset with a break for lunch. One story, which was frequently copied by more advanced students, gives us a somewhat humorous outline of the course of a student's day, likely meant less as an actual record and more to reinforce what's expected of a model student. In the morning, he harasses his mother for some bread, which he takes to school for his lunch. He sounds like something of a spoiled child, but it's hard to tell how the Babylonian teachers and students would have viewed him. When he arrives at school, he shows his teacher his homework from the night before, which the teacher condemns as wretched, and the boy is caned. In fact, it seems that the boy was caned regularly, for talking in class, for growing sleepy, for getting distracted, for failing to show proper respect to the teacher, for having sloppy handwriting, for failing to follow instructions correctly, or for making errors in general. The cane was readily at hand for frequent educational thrashings, and the modern saying, I ought to teach him a lesson, bore rather the same connotations for the Babylonians as it does for us. In the morning, this model student would have been given tablets in which the instructor had written a line or two on the top half, which the student was expected to copy on the bottom half. We have many of these, and the quality of the handwriting varies from pretty good to absolutely atrocious. In fact, one of my favorite parts of researching this episode has been the places where modern scholars mock the deficiencies of students who've been dead for 4,000 years. Not exactly the sort of immortality I would hope for. These morning exercises would be judged, harshly, then it would be lunchtime. Following lunch, the model student would free write a section, copying perhaps from another tablet, or from memory, or from an oral dictation. Upon finishing the afternoon tablet, the student would carry it home with him, so proud of his work that he would sit with his father and read out what he had written that day over dinner to an equally proud father. Literacy, remember, was an incredibly rare and valuable talent, akin in many ways to magic. The example student, who, remember, is a bit of an ass, then demands that food and water be brought to him, that his feet be washed and his bed made so he can go to sleep and repeat the process the next day. Whether his poor attitude was part of the humor or simply expected from a rich kid who likely had a household slave to do things for him is unclear. The curriculum was based almost exclusively on memorizing things by copying them again and again, likely with oral instruction accompanying the copying to provide pronunciations and contexts. The most novice of students began by getting introduced into the forms of a single cuneiform sign, how to carve a single wedge shape, and then on to the basic syllable sounds each character could make. He would then begin to write his first of many word lists, which are exactly what they sound like. Long lists of words grouped around some category or another. There are lists of names, trees, wooden objects, animals and meats, reed, leather and metal objects, stones, plants, fish, birds, foods, geographical places, and types of clothing, among others. 
The Sumerian language is in many ways like the modern Japanese language, with a mix of Chinese characters that carry some particular meaning and phonetic characters that communicate sounds and grammar. Though unlike modern Japanese, the same characters were used for both grammar and meanings, and the two must be distinguished through context. With between 600 and 900 characters, each with multiple readings and grammatical functions as well, simply learning the dead language would take a great deal of effort. Then, they would also need to learn Akkadian as well, though this would have been easier since it was a much simpler written language, and while many of the elite would have natively spoken the Babylonian dialect of Amorite, Akkadian was still the language of common usage. With the basics of Sumerian and Akkadian memorized, the young student would move on to more advanced vocabulary, with longer words as well as the beginning of mathematics. You see, 97% of surviving clay tablets from across ancient Mesopotamia are business transactions, accounting records, and legal documents. Mathematics was as much a core part of the scribal art as literature. Basic math was memorized, just like the word lists were, and from the listings we can see children learning multiplication tables, conversions between common units of weight and measure, and basic geometry. Babylonian math and science would come to be famous throughout the ancient world, and indeed on down to modern times. But the glorious heights of astronomy, astrology, and advanced math for which they are justifiably famous are inventions of the Neo-Babylonian period, some 800 years away. But that doesn't mean the old Babylonian scribes didn't have some neat mathematical tricks. The numbers themselves were typically reckoned in base 60, and used place values, putting them above even the much later Romans for sophistication. 60 is a very useful number in the days before calculators, because there are so many clean and easy ways it can be divided, making for a relatively larger number of simple fractions than our own base 10 system. As well, they had some pretty neat tricks to simplify the process of seemingly complex mathematical topics, such as finding the inverse or square roots of numbers, with the technique of finding an inverse being one that I don't think was ever invented anywhere else in history, and seems to have been something of a novelty among modern mathematicians when it was uncovered. As well, Babylonian mathematical tablets show usage of the Pythagorean theorem, predating Pythagoras himself by over a thousand years. The mathematical techniques themselves don't get too advanced, but as the student mastered them, they would be moved on to more practical example problems, such as the one we already looked at back in the episode Hammurabi's Siegecraft and Diplomacy, about filling in all the details for constructing a siege ramp. Or alternatively, they could be asked to determine how long it would take to dig a canal of certain dimensions, and what the total cost in wages would be for the workers, along with other logistical details. Pretty basic accounting math, though picking into the details could get fiendishly complicated. And this applied math would not be exclusively a task for sitting on a bench in the shade, though for sure the relatively sedentary life of the scribe was widely regarded as one of the biggest perks of the job. Every graduate of the Eduba would also be expected to be capable of land surveying, both the geometry involved in parsing or creating land records, and also the practical work of taking strings and sticks and sights, measuring and recording accurately, and undertaking the geometric work to determine the perimeters and areas of various subsections of a field. Of course, as a pupil became more advanced in mathematics, he would also be moving on to the more complex copying exercises. Having graduated from single words, he will now copy out full texts from a fairly standardized canon of works, writing a few lines at a time, having them graded, then once all the lines were done, he would break out a much larger tablet and do the entire thing purely from memory. Errors were punished, but it seems that small variations may have been acceptable so long as they were grammatically correct and captured the same basic meaning. 
This would begin relatively simply, with model contracts and lists of proverbs, the latter of which would have the added bonus of reinforcing the boy's moral education. But soon enough, he would be writing first a set of hymns that modern scholars have named the Tetrad, a hymn to Lipit Ishtar, one to Idin Dagon, one to Enlil Bani, and one to the goddess of writing, Nisaba. Upon mastering the Tetrad, there was another set called the Decad, or a group of ten more advanced texts, including stories we've already seen on this show, like Gilgamesh and Humbaba, and perhaps the oldest surviving literary work in the entire world, the Kesh Temple Hymn. The Decad, in turn, was followed by a wider set of literature that may have varied from school to school based on local tradition and whatever either the student or teacher felt like copying out. By now, a student was considered to be an elder brother within the school. He was still learning, but he had advanced enough to help grade the younger student's work and assist with other tasks around the Eduba. Fast approaching the end of his perhaps 8 to 12 year education, he begins to grow obsessed with the looming prospect of his final exam. We have a document which may well be another example of form, not precisely what a test would look like, but likely meant as a model of what could be covered on such an exam. The work begins with the student. Now a young man at the cusp of adulthood, sitting at the feet of a circle of master scribes. Come, my son, sit at my feet. I will talk to you, and you will give me information. From your childhood to your adult age, you've been staying at the Eduba. Do you know the scribal art that you have learned? The student responds that he's ready to answer any question, and they're thrown out to him to respond to orally. Presumably, he would not have even gotten to the final exam if his handwriting had been deficient. The questions begin with the basics. What are the elements of a cuneiform sign, but quickly get more advanced. He's asked about Sumerian cryptography, in which an account or record book could be obscured by replacing signs for other signs. He has to provide translations and synonyms from Sumerian to Akkadian and back again. He's asked to explain grammatical concepts and conjugate Sumerian verbs. He demonstrates deep knowledge of each cuneiform sign by showing that he knows the different calligraphies, phonetic readings, and meanings of many technical words from a variety of industries, from priestly language to smithing to agriculture. He then shows that he knows how to prepare a document correctly by writing and sealing within an envelope. He's quizzed on musical matters, such as conducting a choir and the use of various musical instruments, which would have been integral to many of the religious hymns as well as recreational music. And finally, he's given mathematical problems related to logistics and land surveying. In this particular work, the student seems to have failed the exam, and lashes out at his teacher and older brothers for not teaching him properly, but the work closes with this reproach. What have you done? What good came of your sitting here? You are already a ripe man and close to being aged. Like an old ass, you're not teachable anymore. Like withered grain, you've passed the season. How long will you play around? But it's still not too late. If you study day and night, and work all the time modestly and without arrogance, if you listen to your colleagues and teachers, you can still become a scribe. The scribal craft, receiving a handsome fee, is a bright-eyed guardian, and it is what the palace needs. It seems likely that the teachers were allowing him to stay on and continue learning because school fees were quite high, as were the expected bribes to teachers given by fathers hoping to buy their sons a bit of lenience in grading. But still, once a student had graduated to become a scribe, he'd made it into one of the most comfortable and secure lifestyles available in the Bronze Age. Scribes were everywhere in Babylon, attached to every institution from temples to palaces to the army, and independent scribes were available for hire by private citizens for the many tasks that required it. Scribes read and recorded sacred text within temples, or they went on to become full priests in their own right. Scribes managed the complicated logistics of the professional army and troops on campaign, keeping records and making requisitions to keep everyone fed and equipped.
Scribes sat by every court proceeding to make a record of events and were available for hire when oaths needed to be sworn. A scribe was involved in every loan and every contract, no matter how small, since without a written legal document, the Babylonian courts would not intervene in a dispute. No couple could marry without a scribe to write their wedding vows, a tablet which they presumably kept forever. A citizen wanting to send a letter hired a scribe to write it out for him, and the recipient hired another scribe to tell him what it said. Even at the very highest levels, many government ministers were illiterate, hiring scribes to assist them, and those scribes, in turn, could well gain enough experience to be named to ministerial positions themselves. And at the very top of society, only a small handful of kings could read and write. It's hard for us to imagine an illiterate Hammurabi, and he may well have been one of the exceptions, but we have nothing to confirm literacy from any but a few kings, most notably the scholar king Shulgi of Ur, discussed in the episode Rebirth of Sumer. In every way, the scribe was the glue that held Babylonian society together and enabled its complex economy and government. And they weren't taken for granted. To an illiterate citizen of Babylon, a scribe must have seemed to be a species of wizard, living in the magical realm, not the purely physical. He would have appeared different from other men, softer, and in many ways more like a modern man, because he missed out on much of the habitual physical labor under the hot sun that defined so much of every other occupation and lifestyle. He was well-fed and wealthy without putting in the hard work of a craftsman, and while our written sources tell us that he was admired for having made it into this easier life, there must have also been a hit of jealousy mixed in as well. And a scribe could do impossible things. He could use his magic simply by waving a block of clay to speak with the dead and describe events that had occurred hundreds of years previously. Or, by waving a wand atop the clay, he could speak to men on the other side of Mesopotamia and, once the runner had made it there and back, receive their replies like some form of long-distance telepathy. When men argued about where the boundaries of a property lay and memory failed both parties, the scribe with his clay could cast out sticks and strings and know the truth of the matter, as decreed by men who may be long dead. While counting and the most basic of math was likely fairly widespread, a scribe knew the secret tricks to turning the figures of individual harvests from individual years and fields into estimates of productivity, and only he could organize the great building and military projects that separated Babylonian civilization from the barbarians who built nothing. And when a king wanted his words to be heard by generations as yet unborn, when he wanted his very thoughts to stretch even 4,000 years into the unknowably distant future, it was a scribe who transformed his words into the very stones of the earth to last for all eternity. And when the scribe was finished for the day, or when contracts began to run a bit thin, Every now and then, a scribe would pull out a spare piece of clay for himself. And after a long day of writing other people's words, sometimes words would bubble up from his own soul, a gift of the goddess Nisaba, or in later times the god Nabu. And he would press stylus on clay in a wholly new pattern. Perhaps he would write out a hymn to a god inspired by his own personal devotion. Perhaps it would be a new legend, or a new spin on a popular tale that had been circulating around town in purely oral form. Maybe it would be a series of curses aimed at someone who had irritated him, or a humorous ditty to bring laughter at a drinking party. The names of these original authors are in nearly all cases unknown, but it was men like this, and in one case a woman, and Heduana, who wrote nearly everything that we've spent 52 episodes discussing, and nearly everything that will make up the rest of the content of this series. These are the oldest authors of the oldest stories, and I consider it an honor to be able to share their stories with you in this podcast. Next week, we will stay in the literary realm. The philosophical masterpiece of the Old Babylonian period, at least among what has survived, is a work called The Poem of the Righteous Sufferer. 
In spirit, it's a continuation of the inquiry begun in the work A Man and His God, discussed in the episode Oldest Debates, and is an example of theodicy. The theological inquiry into the nature of evil and suffering in the world, an area of philosophical investigation that remains active even today. So join us next week as we see these scribes tackle some of the hardest questions at philosophy and get a deeper sense of how the Babylonians saw their relation with the gods and their place in the world. Thank you for listening.